Excuse me. Well, on behalf of Huntington Beach uh, Central Public Library, welcome to uh, Birding 101. Uh, we are happy to uh, see uh, the uh, large number of people that are interested, and I think uh, uh, you're going to have fun. I uh, giving the presentation today will be uh, Babs Leviton and myself, Ron Krasnitz. A uh, little bit about uh, Babs. Babs uh, has uh, a bachelor's in science and a master's in library science from uh, Rutgers University. Grew, grew up uh, in a dairy farm in Northwest uh, New Jersey. And that's where she acquired her love, love for nature. And you, you'll see that come out in, it oozes out of every pore of uh, Babs. And uh, she's on the board of Bolsa Chica Land Trust. She's a tour gu guide for the Miracles at a Marsh program. Gives tours of uh, Bolsa Chica twice a month. Is a certified naturalist uh, by Audubon and uh, gives nature tours uh, sponsored by Sea and Sage. Uh, Audubon, and uh, myself, I'm uh, work with uh, the library. I uh, coordinator for uh, our maker space, and uh, was uh, in charge of uh, the tours. Uh, for the miracle of March at uh, Bolsa Chica and uh, gave tours uh, myself and uh, a past uh, board member. And we're going to go into, let me admit a few more people here. And I'm going to uh, shift to share screen so that uh, we could start the presentation. Babs, would you like to say a few a few words? Okay. I know she's going to say a lot of words, but well, uh, a little bit about yourself. Well, we'll see how this turns out. So this was an idea that Ron got, and he um, he kind of approached me and said, "Hey, would you like to do this?" And I said to him. Yeah, that's that sounds kind of neat. You know, I I I really love doing the public tours at the Bolsa Chica. I I mean, we're Huntington Beach residents. I mean, most of you are probably Huntington Beach residents, and we're so fortunate here that we have these open spaces. But they didn't just happen if 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 the community had not banded together and said, "Hey, we want to keep these places. Uh, these are really important to us." It, enriches our lives. So anything that that I can do that that makes it a more meaningful experience. I love working with the kids there. And um, the Sunday tours, um, I have, I'm involved with the ones that the Land Trust does, but other um, organizations in the area and, and including Sea and Sage actually, of course, is in uh, the city of Irvine. It's down by UCI. They also give you know, uh, you know, weekend tours where uh, different people volunteer to go out and walk and talk about what you're seeing and explain, you know, how, why, when, where, why. That's not what we're going to do tonight. We're going to do rudimentary, um, uh, you know, how you get started birding. And I don't know, some of you are probably already doing birding and because anyone who's interested in this probably is thinking about it. But I do remember that when I first decided to get into this, I kind of went, whoa, I don't know anything about this. I mean, I know about, you know, working alongside of nature and, you know, it's, it's hard work on a farm. I was really happy when I went away to university. It was, it was less work, <laughs> didn't matter, you know. But um, I still love to go back and visit there. I very, feel very connected to the land. And I feel very connected to really, um, you know, the open space that we have here in Huntington Beach, it really, it really makes life more meaningful. So um, 
we are going to have, uh, if you have a question, Ron is going to watch it. You can like, uh, you can put it on the chat. If it's something that can wait till the end and we'll answer it. But if it's something that would be really meaningful, uh, well, we'll leave it up to Ron. He's, he's, uh, you know, he was my, he was the, you know, the guy that coordinated the tours for a number of years while I was doing these, these things. Uh, so I, I trust that he'll know what's, what's, what should be dealt with and how to deal with it. So what you see up on the screen right now, um, and I wanna tell you just a little bit about working with Ron. When Ron gets an idea, he really follows through. And so, um, you know, um, but the library program that he got so involved in, it seemed like it gobbled up his life was, it, what is it, makerspace at the library? You know, he's really dedicated to that. And um, I say anything you have a passion for, you are going to enjoy. <laughs> and um, the people I've met, um, you know, just getting out and volunteering, you know, have enriched my life. And I always hope that I'll enrich theirs. Okay, so if you're gonna go out and, and go do a little birding, if you bring a few things with you, a lot of people, they run, they run out and they think about, um, you know, I wanna, I wanna go out there and I wanna see as many birds as I can see. A little planning in advance is probably a great idea. So um, I would say, and Ron told me a funny story. He said that he had company in town and he was kind of tied up and, and he said, oh, I, lo I love this place where I'm volunteering. Why don't you run over to the Bolsa Chica and I'll join you there. So he said he joined them after a while and they had not seen any birds, but they didn't have any binoculars with them. Luckily, Ron had binoculars in his car. Um, it is true that birding is something that, that is different than your everyday fast paced life. Um, you see more things if you're open to just letting it happen in front of you. Um, so binoculars are really important and um, if you want to figure out what the birds are, like if you think, if uh, you know a lot of the birds, I mean, because we coexist with them. We're in the animal kingdom, they're in the animal kingdom, they live alongside of us, and um, they need all the same things to survive that we need. And, you know, as long as we have mutual respect for each other, <clears throat> we get to coexist. And I don't know, we're watching the birds. It, how many of you, just shake your head, how many of you think the birds are watching us? Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe they are. Because I know that my hummingbirds, if I, if I let the nectar feeders go empty, they come and they, they kind of make a racket in front of the window. It's kind of like, are you in there? <laughs> so I think, I think they are watching us. And that's, that's kind of cool because that's how you kind of share the animal kingdom, I think. And, all right, so, um, so if you think that, that you want to capture the memory, you know, taking a camera with you, Ron has some ideas of what would work well, um, or a lot of you have cell phones. I will tell you that if all you're taking the pictures for is so that later you can kind of remember what you got to see, or you can figure out more about what you saw if you had questions and you were lo you're looking it up in a book. Um, some people, um, Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some, some of the stuff that will pop up on the chat will just be funny and it'll be fun. <laughs> it'll be fun to see how people react. Um, anyway, um, a birding book is nice, but remember when you go out for a walk, how much weight do you wanna carry? And I'm gonna talk a little more about that. So if you have a cell phone, it is also a very powerful computer. And Ron's gonna talk to you a little bit and a little bit about a birding app. Um, if you don't, if you're not already using birding apps on your phone, they're, they're great fun. And you don't actually have to carry your book. You can leave your big book at home and then go home and cuddle up with it, you know, with the notes you take. And that brings me to the next point. I always take a little tiny pad of paper. I, I learned this from my birding class teacher. So, and I take a pencil. And um, I do a lot of bird, bird surveys now. So I write down little, just little notes, but if I'm seeing something really cool, I don't write it down. I kind of imprint it in my brain. I go, oh, I want to really remember 
what that looked like because I know it has a lookalike and how am I going to make sure that I know what I had? Well, one of the things you can do is take a quick picture. And if you're lucky enough to get one that has the field mark, oh, we already got into that part, that will tell you which one of those birds it was, that would be great. But definitely I usually carry pencil and paper and I always wear a hat with a brim. And I stress this because I'm old and I let my skin on the farm get all wrinkly because I didn't wear a hat when I was young. But now as an old person, I wear a hat because I don't have to wear sunglasses a lot of the time. Cause see the inside of my brim, is kind of dark. And when I'm out there and there were people, one time I showed up for the tour and I forgot my hat. And one of the other tour guides said, nobody's gonna recognize you. And they never saw you without a hat. You always had a hat on. So when I go out there, I wear a hat, but whatever is comfortable for you <clears throat> or a cap. Okay. The binoculars, that's the first thing. So a lot of you already have binoculars and you might be really happy with them. They might be just right. When I'm gonna look at the little birds at Huntington Central Park, I, wear, I always carry a pair of binoculars. I usually carry 842s. Number one, there's less glass in them. They're a little lighter. I like that, <laughs> less weight to carry around. Um, and, but they have a real clear resolution. So those little tiny birds, they're, you know, but I do a lot of work, a lot of work out on the beachfronts and in, uh, you know, in the, uh, the Bolsa Chica. And so when I go there, I take a little more power with me, eight, uh, 1042s. These are the really common binoculars that people, people, you know, use for birding. And that was something that I learned in the very first birding class I took. I actually took the one through with Audubon Society and it's actually given by a lady that lives here in Huntington Beach. And so she taught me much of what I know really. Um, consideration when you're buying, if you don't have binoculars that you think are going to make it so you can really see the birds, um, then you're gonna, when you get ready to shop for them, you don't want to think how we want them to weigh. And um, the other thing that's really handy is get a harness for them so that they're not hanging around your neck. If my purse, if I put my purse so that it's like sitting against my neck, I'm ready to just jettison it. I mean, you know, stick my credit card in my pocket and run away without it. So um, I wear... Um, uh, a harness on my binoculars so that there's even, even weight distribution because the binoculars, you know, after you're out there for a couple of hours, they do feel heavy. Um, correct, you know, you want the correct power for what you're looking at. And it turns out this um, one to five or one, one to four is a really good um, ratio for getting really sharp, you know, resolution in the detail in binoculars. If you're buying them, cost is always an issue. And if you already have a pair of binoculars and you're upgrading, when you get ready to buy, just buy the best you can afford. Okay, well, now this is tough. It was tough for me. I had no idea what kind of binoculars to buy. But there's lots of good information online. Uh, Audubon, um, you know, Ron has a, a, a way that you go to the, on the National Audubon site and you can just look at binoculars, or if you just do a search online, um, I will tell you that most of the competitive retailers in optics for birding, and isn't it funny, the company that's in Orange County basically named themselves Optics for Birding, and they are one of the big retailers online. You'll run into them, but Eagle Optics out of Wisconsin is another one I know of. Um, but um, optics for birding is local. They have a small, so you have a small, small storefront in Irvine. Um, and you just have to look on their website and see when they would be in there. And they let you try them out. They'll take you out in the parking lot and spend time with you. I bought my first pair of binoculars there and I did exactly that. I kind of, um, uh, I don't know why my, I got a funny screen that came up. Um, uh, and they spent the time and they made me really think about what it was I wanted. And they had, you know, there were trees and trees there and they, they taught me how to focus binoculars. A lot of you know how to focus. 
but I have to tell you that I had not really used binoculars very much. And so I wasn't very good at it. And so the guy that sold me my first pair of binoculars actually taught me how to use binoculars. And then I ran right off and volunteered and started teaching all the little kids how to use binoculars. Because when I was a kid, I always felt like I couldn't see, I couldn't get to the point where I was using both barrels of the binoculars. And um, so I make sure that the kids know how to do it. Birding Magazine has lots of good information on binoculars too. So you can, you can just go online and find out anything you want to know about. All right, now, camera. Well, there's one in your phone, and if you've got a pretty powerful phone, if something is close to you, I would say, like, if you're into something that's going to be close to you or that you don't need a lot of extra detail, you know, you're going to take your phone with you anyway, probably. Um, but Ron has, uh, Ron and I met about the time there was a camera out that actually was popular with people who were more birders than photographers. But we found out, we asked a photographer if we were going to get a camera. And his, his, you know, he's passed away, but he was an absolutely wonderful bird photographer had been published in birding magazine and all kinds of stuff. And he says, oh, I have this extra camera I have out because my wife is such a birder. And I, you know, she will not tolerate me fuddling around with my photography equipment. So he told us at that time, it was a Canon PowerShop SX. And it worked out. I actually, at least one of the photos that's going to be in the slideshow, I didn't know Ron was going to put that in there. It was actually a picture I took with that camera back when I still felt like taking pictures. Once I became completely enamored with the birds, I find I take fewer and fewer. <laughs> Unless I'm going on a trip. I have a camera for going on trips. Okay, so this is but um, this is uh, kind of Ron's they put together this wonderful uh, data on all of the the stuff that that you can you know just gather up information off of, um, and you know some of this this will be recorded. But Ron, were you going to say anything about uh, these information slides that have a lot of information in them? And uh, don't start taking a whole bunch of notes because I think we can probably help you with that. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, I, at the end, um, or in the chat uh, area, I'm going to give you my email and we'll put together all the informational slides. And uh, if you anybody requesting it, will requesting it, will uh, send it out to them. And there's a, a bunch of slides. This was, uh, you know, just a general overview of the apps, the books, mm -hmm. website, and brochure. And then I put together. Uh, really, I think most people nowadays uh, are going to going to go out with a phone app. And there, there are about, these are the five that uh, I've been using most. And I, I put together what uh, features they have. And I'm going to actually show you uh, identifying a bird and how to use uh, an app. Uh, two of these guys are free, uh, the Merlin and the Audubon. Uh, they, they're both uh, very uh, legitimate organizations. Uh, Merlin is from the Cornell University and then the Audubon Society. The apps are free. Uh, you know, you'll get occasional requests for donations, but uh, they're not uh, offensive with uh, the request. The, other, the others are uh, charge. Uh, and they each have some features, uh, maybe a great database or uh, some other uh, features. The first two, the Merlin and the Audubon, uh, uh, have very nice ability to, if you take a picture or you uh, if, take a picture of a bird or uh, have a picture of a bird, it will uh, suggest uh, birds that uh, it might be and give you the background on it. It will also do, some of them will do searches by song or name. And then they'll have uh, lots of uh, 
info. Some of them are a little stronger than others. Uh, some, uh, you know, like the Audubon is strong in bird info, but uh, not quite as strong. It doesn't have the picture recognition. And uh, then you could keep track of your sightings in some of them, some no. And then the pictures in each of them uh, at, in the comment section and the very end there, some have bird photos and others have uh, drawings and photos. Uh, Sibley, the very bottom one is uh, famous for his beautiful photos, uh, his beautiful drawings. And when uh, you have uh, identification with drawings, the artist can put in all the features or uh, markings that they want. When you're taking live photos, it's a lot tougher to get the right lighting, the right time, uh, get the bird in the right spot, et cetera. So sometimes the, uh, the drawings are a little more uh, informative but th than the photos. But uh, you could see uh, the various options. And so this will be available to you. And so then we're moving on to identifying field marks of birds. And we put this in their important study the markings as long as possible. Not now, but when you're out birding, you know, the, you see a bird and you want to uh, look it up right away and say, oh, what is that guy? I think it, you know, but the important thing, and Babs has mentioned it, you know, with that pad of paper, study the markings as long as you as possible, because by the time you go look to, in your book or in the app, uh, that bird may be gone. So look as long as possible at the bird, make notes, then look up in your reference. Uh, reference app. And we're going to be looking, uh, you'll see in the app, uh, size, colors, uh, you know, color marking, size, shape, and then activity or habitat. And in the uh, slides that we'll show, uh, we have a, a listing there of uh, showing each of the bird the, the relative size. So because just putting a number down sometime is hard for me to, uh, to understand uh, the relative size. So we put that in with each slide. So I'm going to show you now, uh, just uh, going to bring this guy up and what I'm doing now, there are two birds. We're going, I'm going to show you how we use the app uh, to identify a bird and how simple and easy it could be. And so uh, we're going to do two birds and then we'll move into, we have uh, quite a few birds that will go through and they're mostly found in the local local area here. So we'll give you what to look for on it, how to identify it, and uh, what their uh, specific markings are, and uh, what to look for in your app. So I have, uh, we have two birds here, and then we have one bird here, and then we're going to look at this guy. And so we'll and to identify him. So I'm going to, uh, the app uh, that we're going to use was the first one that I showed was Merlin. And that's the one uh, from uh, Cornell University. And I have it on the phone, but it's also available uh, on the website. So it's uh, a lot easier to and do in this particular thing is demonstration to use the one on the website, but it's identical. So I'm going to stop share for a second and open that one up. And just one sec. And so here we are with the Merlin uh, app. It's the on the web, 
but uh, this is identical to what's uh, in your uh, in an app. So you start out, let's start the ID. It wants to know where you are because uh, you know it will make a difference if you're northwest or in Florida or northeast, et cetera. So we're just going to say current location. And hopefully we're going to get. And then it wants to know when, because the birds you're looking at, as you'll see further down the line, uh, can have different looks at different uh, times in the breeding season, in uh, molting season, et cetera. And so we're putting in the date. And then it wants to know, okay, what was the, what was the size of the bird? So that first bird, I'm going to say, was somewhere in here, somewhere between a sparrow and a robin. And then we're going to go next, and it wants to know what color was the uh, that bird. So it was basically black. It had some red rufous and a little bit of a yellow in it. So I marked the colors that we've seen on the, in the bird, and we move on. And then what was it doing? Well, it was on a branch. So I'm going to say in a tree or bushes. And we move on. Now it's looking for the birds. And lo and behold, surprise here. But we found it. It's a red-winged blackbird. And uh, it'll also, the site will also show you other, this is a female of the red-winged. This is the uh, non-breeding male. And they all may look different, but different, but the app is great in that uh, if you had picked this coloration, it would also come up with that bird. And you know, it, here are other birds that it thought might be potentials for that uh, that description you you gave. So, I'm going to go back now. Let's go back. And we're going to start the ID again. And I hope you remember what we saw on the uh, second bird. And that's uh, today. And that guy was somewhere in this size range. He was pretty big. And it was basically white. And the beak was yellow. So I'm. Um, highlighting those two, moving on. And it was uh, kind of swimming by the water there, swimming or waiting. And we hit next. Now it's looking for possible birds. And lo and behold, we have uh, the uh, great egret. The snowy one has a black, uh, a black beak, but the Great egret has the yellow beak, and the one that we were looking at had uh, this yellow beak. So, and different birds that might have filled that description. And then here we're looking at uh, different times or different positions of, of that bird. And so, basically, I just, just wanted to go through with you in an app that you could have on the phone with a few key uh, identifying marks, you can quickly identify the bird. And so I'm going to stop sharing this and we're gonna go back and start sharing the presentation again and turn it back over to Babs. Okay, all right, so here's the question. Is there a best time to go birding? So this is the slide they're on made up. Um, well, yeah, everybody hears about spring migration. If you want the greatest diversity of different kinds of birds, just huge numbers of birds moving out and moving in. Well, you, you get going in the spring. I mean, they're in addition to the Christmas bird count, you know, they actually run a very significant, the first week of May, spring count because you get you get a big picture of what's happening so a lot of birds leaving you know they're now they're 
they're going to go north. They're going to find, you know. Okay, so it's it's a it's a hot time, and it, you know it'd be a good time, but in the winter, you also have a lot of birds because birds have come that that nested in the north. They're not going to do well in the really cold weather, so they're going to come south, and that tends to be a lot of the waterfowl and the shorebirds. And so I'm going to show you some sample pictures of some of those tonight, just because it's fun to look at birds. Um, the summer is kind of a quiet time once you get into the end of the summer, but it's not quiet at the Balsa Chica until the terns leave. So, you know, it depends. A question like this has about a thousand answers, really. So, um, but in the fall, just as there's a spring migration, there's a fall migration. It's just that in the fall, for some reason, it's more staggered. In other words, there are some some species that they molt before they before they migrate and some of them molt after they get here and when birds are molting they can't really fly so it you just they they arrive at different times so what pretty much here where we're on the pacific flyway i mean basically the fifth pacific flyway just goes right over if you're standing in in the bolsa chica all right what time of day is best I don't know if you've ever heard the term, the morning song or the dong song and birders just live for the dawn song. So what you we, all the crazy people, even for Christmas bird count, go out there, it doesn't matter how cold it is, we bundle all up and we get out there and we stand there, oh God, where's the sun? And the sun comes out and the birds start to sing. And it isn't just casual and they also start to call. And what it is, is it's serious business. They haven't had any food. And birds are, you know, birds have a real high energy, you know, need. Uh, I mean, they can't make it through the day if they don't eat. So um, the morning is the best time in my book because it's when the birds are waking up and they're, they really get down to the business of finding food. Now, in the reverse, as it, the, the evening is also a really good time because the birds are getting ready, ready to go to, you know, to sleep. And they will be out once again. It's all about them finding the food. But food is not the one number one concern of a bird. The number one concern of all every single thing in the animal kingdom is water. So water and food and shelter. So, you know, um, we need the same things, you know, so the birds, the birds have favorite places. If you're in a habitat where you've got those three things, you're gonna have birds. Um, midday gets really calm because think about it. Now they have foods. I don't know about you, but when I'm not hungry, I'm not, I, you know, uh, and I'm already full uh, and I've been up all morning looking for food. Maybe I'll take a nap, okay? so. So they, uh, like, if you're looking for sandpipers or something, I'm sorry, they're going to take a nap. They're going to take a nap in the middle of the day, but they'll definitely take a nap when the tide is high because they can't get, they can't look for food anyway. So you have to kind of take a look at the habitat. And so I already told you about water, food, and shelter, which is on this, this thing. And um, there are a lot of different habitats in Huntington Beach. It depends about what kind of birds you're looking for. If you're looking you know, the wetlands that we have, the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve and the Huntington Beach wetlands that are there um, on the inland side of Pacific Coast Highway around Brookhurst and Magnolia and uh, all the way up to, um, what is that, Newland. Uh, they, they're, they're good places to, to see shorebirds. And then the parks, the parks in Huntington Beach are very birdy. And those first two, and they're listed that way because there is a lot of species diversity in Central Park. And it depends on whether you're on the east or the west side. And the only way you find out whether it's kind of birds that you wanna watch is you've just gotta get out there and do the walking. It's good for you health-wise to get out there and walk the parks. But there are some really little parks that also are known for being really birdy. I mean, uh, the John Baca and the car and the gear, Greer. But there's lots more, I bet you the, in the neighborhood you live in, you've got a good park. Then 
we have five beaches, two state beaches and two city beaches in Huntington Beach. Used to be only three, but Huntington Beach and next Sunset Beach. So we've got a second city beach, yay. So we've got Huntington, Huntington and, and Sunset Beach, and then we've got Huntington State Beach and we've got the Bolsa Chica State Beach. So those are, those are good places to find birds because they have the perfect ingredients for, you know, the birds, the birds need those things, so they're here. Um, if we don't have what they need to survive, birds, birds can fly. You know, we've got a car, but they've got wings. And they'll just they'll just go off and they'll find what they need. And if they don't, then it's survival of the fittest. They don't survive if they can't adapt. Okay, so variations in appearance. So they're influenced by the following. Um, you know, you see a bird and it doesn't, it looks like something, you know what it is, but it's not the right color or it's, um, uh, you know, there's just something that's off. So you have to be thinking, well, is it a female or a male? Because in birds, in certain um, species of birds, they don't look alike. <laughs> you know, the two, the two genders do not look alike. Okay, the season, uh, you know, um, in the winter, in the dead of winter, all those beautiful shorebirds that, that were nesting in the Arctic, oh my God, they come back here and they still look pretty nice. They look like they've still got their classy, I'm looking for a girlfriend or boyfriend clothes on. But pretty soon they go to just very drab plumages because they go through and then, and they're not going to expend the energy once their hormones kick up again. And, and it, actually during the winter while they're here, they do, but they come back and they look kind of drab. And then, so don't be disappointed. Sometimes in the fall, the birds look pretty, pretty drab and the age. I'm going to say a funny thing here because gulls don't mature for a few years and man, do they look different? than the adults, the young gulls. Um, and uh, there'll be some other things. We'll see some slides where I'll probably comment on the, that, that it's a first winter bird. Did you know that in birds sometimes like when they're chicks, there's the, and then once they get ready to fledge, then they're like juveniles. And then um, if they're sticking around and you're gonna see them for the whole year, then they go through this thing, they're sitting around and they're not quite the right color yet. That's that business about not being the right color. And that just has to do that it's their very first year, or in the case of gulls, at least two years go by, or in the case of bald eagles, about four or five years go by before you get the real deal adult bird and make it look like the pictures you see. Um, Ah, so, you know, people have been noticing that there's some difference in the birds in their neighborhood. I saw that go by and I love it. You know, we've got somebody who already knows how to take notes because he knew that the eye color was different. And, and in that particular bird that he mentioned, and it's in the chat, the, the eye color is different. All right, so this is a perfect example of the male and the female during breeding season of looking different. And he looks so classy and he only looks like this at the end of winter and into the spring. And she looks, um, she's a pretty bird. If I wanted a really beautiful coat, I might prefer hers because it would go with more of my outfits, but they don't get a choice. This is, this is her deal. Why is she not as flashy as he is? Well, for one thing, these are ground nesters. She's gonna sit on eggs on the ground. And you know what, really? She'd look like a meal to a coyote or a peregrine falcon, really. But what if she's brown like the ground? Great camouflage. She's just sitting there. She covers up that those uh, uh, tertials or you know, the speculum in her wing. I mean, if she's showing her beautiful little you know, iridescent or, you know, structural colored feathers. Yeah, she's noticeable, but she isn't very noticeable when she's on a nest, especially if she's on something that looks like her. All right, so here's the American goldfinches. And sometimes the difference is not whether the, the gender, sometimes it's just 
the time of year, whether the hormones are, are, are active. So in the American goldfinch, which I mean, is a pretty cool looking bird. And we do have, we have a couple parks here that have American goldfinches in them. Um, and they're around all year long. We just don't tend to notice them. And guess why? Just look at that slide. You know why you don't notice them? Because when, they're, when the male is in breeding season in the spring and singing, he also announces himself, right? <laughs> he's singing and singing. Um, he's beautiful. But in the winter, it's, you know, uh, he molts out and he hasn't put all those beautiful, um, um, you know, yeah, you know, the, he's, the plumage will change as the season goes. So uh, in the non-breeding season, the American goldfinch doesn't quite look like himself. He looks like a lot of other little birds that you're going to see in the parks and you're going to go, well, where did my goldfinches go? Well, they're still there. They're just, they're just in their off season plumages. And believe me, if you think that male in the off season looks drab, you should see the female. She really looks drab. So, but it's the same thing. It's, it, it's just the cycle they go through. Okay, so I made a crack at the beginning that the Western gulls. So this is actually a juvenile. This is not even a first winter, but um, two things are happening in this slide. One is begging and the parent looks kind of like, aren't you gonna start looking for your own food? I mean, this bird, this is a, a Western gull that has fledged, but still figures maybe mom or dad is gonna give them some food. And in this case, the gulls that, you know, I, I can't really sex them that easily. So they, they look the same, but in gulls, we're gonna see a couple of other pictures of gulls. It's important that when you see gulls like this, that you think about what you're seeing here. You've got every field mark you need to separate that gull away from the other two dominant gulls in our area. And I'm gonna show you that in another slide, but look at how the juvenile has those pink legs, just like the adult. And those pink legs are one of the field marks for a Western gull. So that's just the little hint. And um, okay, so I think that's all we really have to say about this, but it, so now let's get to birds. Now, I think if I took a survey and said, hey, what kind of birds do you wanna see? You know what every kid says? I wanna see a peregrine falcon. <laughs> and literally, I can bet on it. I could probably lay money on more than half of the kids are gonna ask for a peregrine falcon. And they really do because it's an exciting bird, um, but he's got a lot of field marks on him and he comes in real fast and he's not easy to see. This is that thing, if you're gonna think you're gonna try and figure him out by looking him up someplace, please don't do it because he moves fast. Um, he's the fastest living thing. Um, he hunts in a way that creates great speed. So he goes up real high in the air and he's got excellent eyesight. That's what he's doing here. He's up there and this is deadly. All the little birds on the ground, once this falcon does that, just get nervous. If you wanna see some bird activity, just have a peregrine falcon hunting because um, they're really gonna to start to move around. So he's looking and he goes into something called a stoop and they have tracked a peregrine falcon at 242 miles an hour on a stoop dive. And what he does is he has picked out something down there, another bird, because he hunts other birds and it can be something as big as the one that I saw, the stoop that I've seen was a, um, a elegant turn, which is not a small bird. It's not one of the small turns. It's a pretty big turn. And um, he came down and he hit it. And when it hit the ground, it fell pretty close to me. Now that's too big of a bird for him to catch it in the air with his talons and bring it down. But if he'd hit it like a little, a little um, sandpiper, he could probably, because he can maneuver at 200 miles an hour. I mean, come on, what's not to love there? So that's your peregrine falcon, but the, the, the deal on and all the raptors are gonna be the same way. They all have a flesh tearing beak that's hooked. <clears throat> He's ready to break his food into pieces because all birds, swallow 
whatever food they've got whole. If it's if it's a turn, it's going to follow swallow a fish hole. If it's a you know if it's any of the raptors, they're going to tear it apart. So it's it's a piece that they can swallow. So all the other birds that are going to swallow their food whole have to actually eat food that's pretty small. In the in the food web, it's things that are a lot smaller than they are. But not the peregrine falcons and not most of the raptors. They really are not limited by size. If they can kill it, they can eat it. All right, so now, not all falcons are the same. This is American kestrel. And you know, the peregrine falcons, the males and the females look alike. They look very similar. The only thing is, is the females a little bigger than the guy. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, there are a lot of theories on that. Um, she actually guards the nest more, uh, maybe. Uh, she, who knows? But but usually in a lot of these birds, the raptors, the male is bigger. The female is bigger than the male. And actually, in the American kestrel, it's also a falcon. The female is is bigger than the male. Um, I've seen them in courtship. Um, now. He has brighter blue in his wings. She's got streaky breasts and he has, I mean, notice that I'm doing the field marks. I'm just showing you, if you get yourself in the habit of seeing just little details like that, um, then it's gonna be easy to identify the birds. Now, you can't remember all that. And these, well, the falcons, well, they might just hang around for a little while, but then they're gonna fly off. That's the time to get your little notepad out and write every little thing that you can remember. So you just, if you want to go out birding, just know that if you look down to write your thing, maybe that next field mark you were going to catch about that bird, well, the bird won't be there anymore. I'm sure you've had a bird that you go, oh my God, I want to take a picture of that bird. Well, it's not going to hang around for you. Anyway, so these, these guys, they eat you know, like Jerusalem crickets and lizards and because they're, they're small. Now, peregrine falcons just nest up in a tree. Guess where the little American kestrels nest? They nest, they're cavity nesters. And I guess if I were a littler bird, I wouldn't be so sure I wasn't gonna be somebody's lunch. So maybe it's better for my, my chicks to be in a cavity. Okay, now this is the cleanup crew. Any place there's wildlife, things die of natural uh, causes. And this is probably, what did we decide this was? You saw it, it was it a, a, a night heron or no, it was a grebe, was it? No, it was a heron, it was a Oh, black... it was the black crowned night heron. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can tell by the color of the bill, um, but um, yes, and the, and the bill is, is typical. Um, the smaller of one of the smaller herons, not one of those, well, not one of the big herons. All right, so um, this bird, you know, died of some kind of natural causes there along the water. But what I want you to look here is what it is that a turkey vulture looks like. The in-flight picture, you can't quite see the red head, but you can see the shape, the outline of the bird, and maybe a little under the underwing pattern. And that's things to really, um, Sometimes you'll see a turkey vulture up there and it really seems like a hawk. Uh, but most turkey vultures do what this one's doing, which is they're gliding on the, the winds and they've got the, the wings tucked at what we call the dihedral angle where they tip up. So the, he's not doing anything because his food is dead stuff on the ground. And it takes him a long time of floating around up there, actually smelling the food. They've actually documented how he finds what's on the ground is not necessarily eyesight. Now notice he has no feathers on his head. Can you imagine how hard it would be if you're eating dead things, if you had to clean your feathers on your head around where you were having eating all that stuff? So he has just like this kind of really um, very uh, rough, uh, tough skin on his head and it is red. And if you get a good look at it, the, the head looks red. There are a couple of hawks that have similar underwing patterns to turkey vultures, but uh, they're not they're not nor, they're not the hawks we have around here. Um, but what's different about uh, the turkey vulture is, and I'll just tell you, if you see something that looks like 
fingers at the ends of the wings and it's got tipped up wings, you got a turkey vulture. So, and, and that underwing. Okay, so here's a couple of real hawks. And we're gonna tell these two guys by their tails. Um, actually, we're also gonna tell them by where the red is. And so we've got your a red-tailed hawk and sitting just like you'd see them. Uh, this, this looks like it's a branch, but it could just as easily be a light pole, you know, rod. And um, he's, he, you can't tell that he has a red tail when he's got his tail folded because there's no sunlight coming through it. But when they're in flight, when they're circling around and looking for little critters running around on the ground and they spread their tail, the top feather, the, the, um, the upper tail coverts and the feathers are red and the light from above shines through and his tail looks red. Sometimes you're going to see the red tails flying around and his tail won't look red, but that's because it, the light's not hitting it right. Now, so pretty reliable. These are birds that have a uh, barring on their, well, the, the red tailed hawk has barring, but it's hard to see because he's got red in his tail. It's not black. Now a red shouldered hawk, when he spreads and he is, he is gliding, where is his red? His red is on his shoulders. So Ron says, oh, make sure you say that stuff about sometimes birds are named what they look like. Have you ever noticed that in some of the birds? They're just, there's gonna be another one in here that's just named what it looks like. So the red-tailed hawk, well, he's got a red tail. And the red shoulder hawk, well, he's got red shoulders. And so it was pretty easy. I actually, I kind of like birds that are named what they sound like, makes more sense. All right, an osprey, a one of a kind. There are ospreys all over the world. There are ospreys on every continent, except Antarctica, I guess too cold. And this guy's name is, his nickname in the Pacific Northwest is Seahawk. Do you have any idea why their football team is named the Seahawk? Because Seattle's got a lot of ospreys. And um, the, the other one is fish hawk or river hawk or, you know, Columbia, along the Columbia River, they were called river hawks. This is just, but this guy, what is his field mark? His field mark is a black mask. He, and he'll be, he'll, he'll, once he has, he brings his talons and he, he basically hovers like you see this bird doing. And then he sees the fish on the surface. He goes down and he grabs it with his talons and it can be a pretty big fish. And then he hopefully will be able to lift off because his talons may stick into that fish. If he were to not be able to lift off, unfortunately he might drown if the fish were too heavy. So it's tricky business to be an osprey. But most birds, most bird species are in a genus where there's somebody else in the genus with them that are similar because those, the red-tailed hawk and the red-shouldered hawk are both in the Budio group of hawks. That's the, you know, that's their genus. And uh, they look a bit alike, but the osprey is a one only. He's different than everybody else. And guess what makes him really different? It's what allows him to carry a heavy fish. Most birds have three toes forward and one back. Most raptors, uh, as a matter of fact, all raptors, including this one. But he has his outer toe feather, toe or talon can actually is reversible. Isn't that cool? So he can be two back and two forward when he's carrying. So yes, nobody else can be in his, his genus because because he's a one only and, and they're found all over the world. I mean, I've, you've probably traveled. Okay, so I made that cracker that, you know, um, I believe this is maybe a picture that I took and I'll tell you when I took this picture because we were talking about best time of day to go out. If you're looking for owls, you should go out late in the day because especially if they've been nesting, they will be moving around and feeding the, the, the young in the nest and you, you'll learn a lot about them just by being out there when, when they're active 
So what is the ingredient to seeing birds? Be there when they're eating. When they're eating is the perfect time to see. And we have lots, great horned owl is the dominant owl in the United States. It's found every place all over the United States. And, um, and the marking that, you know, he has a field mark. Lots of owls have barring. His, his chest pattern is pretty unique. You know, he, he has a very regular barring. But the thing is, is those feather tufts on his head, um, you know, look like horns. And there are some others that have it, but he has a, like a perfect set of them. So he's a great horned owl. And the library at, at, um, in uh, Central Park, um, you know, they have a, a nesting pair of great horned owls. And so lots of, lots of people, anybody who hangs around the library has seen, has seen, seen these owls. This is actually was done at the Bolsa Chica. All right, loggerhead shrike. So I, I told you raptors have a flesh tearing beak and they have talons. Okay, well, here is a very unusual bird. It's not real big, it's smaller than the raptors. And it, but it does have a hooked bill, kind of like this. And it does, it is capable of tearing flesh, but it doesn't have talons. It's actually called a loggerhead shrike, but it has a funny, it has a funny name because of how it captures and then doesn't lose what it, what it, you know, its lunch. So it eats mostly insects, you know, it's gonna eat, well, large, large insects. Um, or, and maybe, you know, maybe a very small bird if it were to catch one. Um, but it's called the butcher bird. And the reason is, is that it wants to save that food that is, let's say that there's a whole swarm of things flying around and it's catching them. And it want, and it's, has to catch a lot of them. It actually has a way uh, where it will impale what it has caught on, uh, whether it's on, um, uh, what did it say? You know, like uh, a thorn. Um, if there's barbed wire, people have seen, you know, the prey of a loggerhead shrike impale on a, a barb of barbed wire. But um, they're, um, they can be, uh, they can be around here all year long. Um, they're not real common here along the coast. I think you maybe have to get inland a bit. Um, and they can also migrate. Um, you know, one of the, one of the other birds in their genus is a migratory uh, shrike, but this one is actually a year-round bird. So it's a bird that you could you'll see it occasionally here. I've seen one at the Bolsa Chica, and I think I've also seen one. Um, well, maybe more like the Talbert Marsh. I'm not sure, but. Um, it's, it's a bird that's possible for you to see, but look at the field marks that you've got. It had, it, had, it had that bandit thing, it had the mask like an osprey. So that would be something you'd want to remember because then when you're looking in the bird book, there's probably not another bird that's exactly like this. Um, you know, the outer, the outer wing feather, the, the uh, primaries actually have black tips to them and it has a, a mask on its face and it has a hook on its bill. It has a very, tiny little hook on its bill. All right, so those would be cool field marks for you to know. So, all right, waterfowl. Waterfowl is what makes Huntington Beach a birdie place in the winter because these guys are here all year long. But I'm gonna show you a few other samples, certainly not all of them. In the winter, you could go out and you could just collect huge numbers of species of, of, of ducks and other waterfowl in Huntington Beach because this is their wintering grounds. And so you get to see them, but they don't always look this, well, they, they look this pretty by the time they're going away. And our mallards go through this cycle. And then the male about the middle of the summer, he looks like he's losing all his feathers and he is actually losing all his feathers and he looks a mess. And she molts a little bit later because she's still busy raising the babies, the little chicks, our little ducklings. So um, mallards is our duck that's here all the time, but let's look at some others that come through. Ah, 
look at these guys. These are Northern pintails. And how did they get their names? Oh, I love these birds. They, they basically nest in the North and they have a pintail. And the hunters loved hunting these because don't they look like they've got pretty yummy breasts on them that would make a good meal? Well, and who knows, you know, as, uh, other, other predators, uh, you know, we humans are the, the main predator in the food web in the animal kingdom, but, um, you know, there are lots of other predators. But anyway, the northern pintails, they're dabbling ducks and mallards are dabbling ducks too. And all dabbling ducks, if they really want something that's under the water, sometimes they do what we call the, the butts up because it's right underneath them and they can see it. So, whoops, okay. And what sticks out of the water is the center tail feather. Now, did you notice that these three ducks that are over there, they're not exactly the same? What's not the same is there, you can see, um, you can, see three tail feathers or two tail feathers on one of them and three on the other because only the males get to have that real long tail feather that sticks up. All right, so that's just that's just how it is. Okay, now here are the American widgeons. And remember how the mallard is kind of brown like the ground or plain like the ground? Well, this is a pair of American widgeons and the female, well, she's gonna nest on the ground. She's She's going to be in full camouflage and he actually has this iridescent green you know along his you know the behind his eye but he has this remarkable white he almost looks like he has the hunters call him bald pate but run 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 tell them what you call them well i i need some kind of uh tools to remember a lot of the bird's names. So uh, to me, you know, it's a, a wigan. And to me, the the male looks like he's just wearing a wig. So, yeah. so well, I, I relate wigeon, that, but you know, it's a guy wigeon. with a wig, it must be a wigan. <laughs> I love that. And so, um, and as a matter of fact, there can be a little bit of a blue cast to that kind of gray bill that they have. And as it gets closer to them going back to their nesting grounds, the males will get bluer and bluer. And so that's something that you, you just see some interesting stuff happening with the birds. But so now here's a pair that are also dabbling ducks, but they do look a little different than some of the other dabbling ducks, because for one thing, the wood ducks are prettier. And the other thing, uh, they also uh, can, can hang around here. If, if the wood ducks are in some place like Minnesota, well, they're gonna go south, but um, you can see wood ducks um, here. And as a matter of fact, at some of the inland parks like um, Irvine Regional and uh, yeah, Irvine Regional is a good example. Um, they've put up wood duck boxes around uh, the, the water, the bodies of water there. And um, they're cavity nesters, all the other, dabbling ducks are ground nesters, but not the wood duck. Um, what, what happens is that, and there is another duck that's a cavity nester, but they don't occur in the, in the breeding season here. So we don't, we don't have to know about the fact that the mergansers that come through uh, also will be cavity nesters. And sometimes they laid their eggs in each other's nests even, and you'll have a mixed clutch, to, like if you're in Minnesota where they are. So I was in Minnesota when they had, uh, my relatives had put up a wood duck box and I got to see the, you know, the whole dance of picking a box and, you know, cause they're just aren't, an, they want a dead tree that a woodpecker has made a cavity in. And what do we do with dead trees here? What do we, do we snag them and leave them standing there or do we, get rid of them and chop them down. Well, we chop them down. So um, to help the wood ducks, um, you know, there is a wood, you know, there are clubs that put up wood duck boxes. So if you're lucky enough to be someplace when wood ducks hatch out and there is a reasonable, they can be up pretty high, they can, they can be up as high as 30 feet. And they still do it. They still take what's called that first jump. It's a leap of faith. So what the female does, she actually sets the nest. This guy just struts around on the ground when she's nesting and 
protects the, you know, he's territorial and he doesn't want people walking over by where she's nesting up in the wood duck box. And she says it sits the eggs and they, the, the, the ducklings, they, they hatch out. And when enough of them have hatched, because, and she kind of knows whether or not they're coming, because what I didn't realize is that they can feel the movement in the eggs before the, the ducklings hatch out. So she goes down on the ground and she has this very high little whistle that she makes and they start coming out one by one out of the thing. And they're all fluffy. They're usually about a day old and they just, they just walk right over the edge and they almost like float down. And when they hit the ground, because they're so light and they have all those feathers, they just bounce. You got it. You, do it, just look it up online. Watch a watch a you know a wood duck jump. It's it's like nothing else you'll ever see. All right, so that's so we have those around. Now look at these guys. These are fancy looking ducks. These are blue winged teals, but they don't look like even their babies with these little fluffy little things. They're ground nesters, just like the mallards. And um, these are your blue winged teals. Um, and I, the only reason they're in this position is because he has his white on his face, kind of where the wood duck had it, had the white, but it doesn't mean anything. And they are ground nesters. But the, and okay, now we're going to move over to diving ducks. Diving ducks are interesting. Um, they don't all dive under the water for the same reason. We're going to see a series of diving birds, just a few, just a sample. And this is one of my favorite because these are the littlest ones. These are the buffalo heads. And if you guys have been out in the winter, you have seen the flashy guy on the left. Okay, so that's your male. And um, the one on the right is the female. And I say in this case, she has her white exactly on her head where he has his white. And, but she looks pretty plain. And there are a few other things that look kind of like her, but they don't have the white exactly there. See, this is the thing about field marks. If you know where the white is supposed to be on a bird, you're probably going to be able to identify it. Okay, so he has white along the water line. But I say that you judge the females by the company they keep because the males are flashy. So these are, are uh, ducks that just kind of they dive under the water. They, I, these, I think, actually I chase little little things that are in the water. Maybe not small fish. They're they're a pretty small bird, but yeah, maybe a very tiny little killifish or something. They might. So they have to be able to swim pretty fast under the water. Not as fast as some of the birds we'll see in the diving birds. Okay. So the next one. This is a lesser scop. He more. He. They're not surface feeders as such. They go under the water, but. Do they look like they could swim fast under the water? I don't think they got the right kind of a body for it. You know, the aerodynamics. We're gonna see a bird that can swim fast under the water. Actually, a couple of birds in this slideshow. And, and these are not that. Now, what they're getting or how deep they're gonna go has to do with what food there's down there that they want. So the lesser scop just wants stuff that's still not real deep. They're not gonna you know, bring up something from the bottom. But the next bird is still in the, related to the ducks. It's called a surf scoter. You'll see these out in the ocean also. But one of its foods is it likes like the mussels and the little clams. And, uh, actually the mussels, because they're easier. The clams are hard to crack for this bird. But notice that he has what I call a, a you know, a, a, a shell cracking bill. And, um, she looks a lot like him. When you first glance at it, you don't think she looks like him. But if you look at her profile and everything, and he's got white on the back of her head. And if we had a better picture of her, she would have white in all the same places he has white. But it's kind of smudgy white. And she's very plain. And so that makes me think, I didn't look this one up, but I'm sure they're ground nesters. Anytime you see a female like that. Okay, so what is different about a diving bird that swims fast under the water because they actually catch up with the fish. All right, so this is a Western grebe. Look where their legs are placed. All those other ducks, except for this, the diving ducks, the legs are in the middle of the body. 
look where a, a really fast swimmer's legs are. They're like our legs. And they're not really meant to walk around on land. Doesn't that guy look on the right look really, you know, awkward and maybe like he'll fall on his nose eventually. Um, but under the water, they 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 actually catch the fish. You can watch them diving from the surface. And if you're lucky and you're standing over the top of them, like on that bridge at the Bolsa Chica, you can see them through the water. And they are moving, man. They move fast. He, that they might pop up way down the way. So these are Western grebes. Ruddy ducks actually look a little, uh, they actually dive like that and their legs are also set back, but they're, they're not as slim, slim, um, you know, slim and trim as, as you're really fast uh, swimming underwater diving ducks, but they're easy to see. Have you ever seen a whole group of ducks hanging around out there and these little tails are all sticking on that angle? These are, these are in a group of ducks called the stiff-tailed ducks and ruddy ducks being the, the one. And so this is a male ruddy duck. And what is his field marks? In breeding season, his bill is blue. And that just drives anybody on the, any of the kids on the tour is just crazy. If, but you know what about the time his, Bill turns blue, he flies away. He's gonna nest north. He's not gonna stick around for us, but he does have that white cheek. And if we had a picture of her, she would have a kind of a smudgy thing on the side of her cheek, but she would have the same field mark that we look at when we sit, look out and see these ducks out there, a light cheek and a stiff tail. And so field marks are pretty easy. Okay, now here's a bird that will go underwater to get its food. But it kind of does it more like that lesser scop, which is that it will dive under and it does, it gets a big percentage of its food under the water, but it doesn't chase it. It kind of gobbles it up underneath, but it also forages on the, the ground. And this is a duck, this is the American coot is in a different genus, but it actually stays around all the time. Yes. The feet are funny looking. That just came up in the chat. Absolutely, I was getting to that. When they are foraging on the ground, they are the weirdest, knobbiest, ugliest looking feet you ever saw. But they're almost like you want sh like fins that look like that just so that you could be different. They've got almost like little rings on them. They look, they look really weird. But um, we've got huge bunches of American coots in a lot of the parts. And so just hang out and and watch them a little bit because they'll climb out and they'll get some food, but they get most of their food in the water. So they're technically in, they're not, they're not real divers. And as a result, their legs are not all the way at the back of their body. They're in the middle of their body because a lot of the times they're out of the land, but they're clumsy because the webbing is, is probably useful for them for swimming under the water. Okay, shorebirds. All right, I spend half my life, you know, just watching shorebirds. So let's start with the really cool looking ones that can wade out in the water because it's the shore, of course. And, you know, this is a pretty good sized bird, 18 inches, tip of the bill to tip of the tail. And it's an American avocet. Now we have two stilts in this slideshow. This is the first one. It gets its food by wading out into the water you know, with its long legs. And it's just sweet its bill back and forth along the surface of the water and scoops up all the little insects and little little um you know uh, critters that are living in the water because and its bill tips up so it can just kind of sip them in it just scoop 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 or, you know just just skimming it right off the top so this is the american avocet ah! but remember i said there was going to be another bird that was going to be named exactly what he looks like this is the black neck stilt and he is high his field marks galore, not the least of which is his naming of having a black neck. But what is his dominant field mark? Pink legs, you know, orange pink legs. And the other thing I want to teach you about birds, if you don't already know this, the bird on the right, that's that is his, um, the end of, that's his toes. 
his ankle is up there where he, see, because he looks like his knees bend the wrong way. That's because it's his ankle, it's not his knee. <laughs> so he's got the longest foot going, but he, he basically goes around on his toes. So that was your black neck stilt. That would be easy to write down all the field marks real fast. Okay. So here we're gonna to move to other, we're gonna start with the littlest ones. And these are the sandpipers. And um, the least sandpiper is probably about a half, what is it? A, oh, well, it says they're both six inches. There's some debate whether or not there's a difference. And they look very similar, the Western and the least. The least is paler. That's the best way to put it. But you know what the major field mark is here is the leg color. The bills is because the least turn is our least sandpiper is lighter. His bill is a little bit lighter, but and not as black as a Western sandpiper, but the Western sandpiper's legs are black. In that, I guarantee you, in that group of sandpipers, almost all of them will be Western sandpipers. They're a flocking, like when they get decide to fly, they do bird ballet, these beautiful big swooping groups of Western sandpipers flying around over the top of the mud flats and settling back down. Least sandpipers, are probably mixed in there because they want the same food and they get their food the same way. They've got little short legs, so they don't want it, they don't want the water too deep. They've got to probe in the mud and get little, little critters out of the mud to eat. But they're not, they don't flock together. Um, you're lucky if you get three least sandpipers all together. Um, so if you've got a uh, one that just kind of stands apart from the rest of the group, look at the color of the legs. And if they look kind of brownish like mud, just figure it's still a leaf sandpiper and he just got mud on his legs. So birding is fun because you can make up your own story about these birds. Now we're gonna show you another picture of another bird that looks a lot like those least and Western sandpipers. This is a sanderling. Now, Almost never do we have any sanderlings in the Bolsa Chica where you've got, you know, you have tidal flow on the tidal basin, but there's not really wave action. This is the bird you see on the beach front. His food gathering is completely different. Oh my gosh, in this picture, he has scored a tiny little crab, it looks like. Okay, but the colors on his back are very similar to a Western sandpipers, but you won't ever, you, once you, and he has dark legs, not as dark as a Western sandpipers. Notice that I'm noticing everything about that's going on with these birds. Uh, his belly is a little bit too much demarcated that the light to the dark, the other birds were a little more modeled, but the behavior is what's gonna tell you who this bird is because every time the wave, the wave rolls in and when it pulls back out, it exposes the sand. And right in that sand are all these little crabs and other little creatures. So they wait up on the beach. And as soon as the wave is moving out, they run to the edge and they know how far to go. They're just looking at the water and they have time to put that bill that looks a lot like those other bills. They put it down in the sand and they grab that little crab and they have to run back up the beach before the wave comes and sweeps them because it could really, you know, they won't do well. They've got, I mean, look how short those legs are. That's not something to go play in the wave with, waves with. So there's a, these birds, you'll always see them on the beach. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about another bird that's on the beach with the sanderling. And some people even, because this bird is the one on the left is an endangered species that lives here all year long. And you know what? I bet most of you that go to the beach, you've never seen one. Start looking for them. They're there because they're on certainly both Huntington State Beach and Bolsa Chica State Beach. We have them, they're here. And in the winter, they kind of roost or hang out on the beach. In the summer, some of them will come in and they'll nest on the Bolsa Chica, but in the backlands where it's all fenced off because they're an endangered species. 
and we're trying very hard to have them continue to exist. But take a look at the bird on the right. When you first see him, the, the snowy plover, his, his ring only, his necklace only comes like to the front of his throat and it stops where the semi-palmated plover comes all the way around. Now look at the leg color, completely different. And the leg color on a semi-palmated is, is the same as the bill. So he's got yellow on his legs, yellow on his bill, and he doesn't have as dark of an eye. He's got an incomplete, he's got a complete neck ring. Snelly plover only has that little bit. These are the things, but when you see them foraging together in a group on the beach, what they're doing is the kelp washes in and in the kelp, after it lays there for a little bit, are there are all these little flies and the snowy plover, that's their main food. So you're gonna see them on any beach that is an overgroomed where they allow the kelp to sit at the rack line. And so um, the uh, state parks and beaches, they have a program going to try and help the snowy plovers. And so they don't overgroom groom the beaches anymore because if you overgroom them, you take all the food away. Okay, now this is another member of the plover family. What it has in common with those other guys is it has that bill that can pick up those little critters out of, you know, it could, it could forage on the beach and it could eat the little flies and stuff that are in the kelp. But the killdeer is everywhere. I can go up in the mountains and any body of water that I buy, I might see a killdeer. And he also has a distinctive, usually it sounds more like deer, like that. They'll fly over you and you just know you've got a killdeer. Or sometimes it, it does say its whole name. It'll have a k before the deer. And so they're called killdeer, but and they are in the same genus as the snowy plover and the semi-palmated. They're just much bigger. And they're not only on the ocean front, they're, you know, they're they're inland. You'll see them. As a matter of fact, in um, the Seattle area, I saw I saw uh, some nesting on the top of one of the school buildings that was at least close to the, the water. But I mean, it was remarkable to me. I go, oh my God, they like to nest on gravel. They like to put their nests on gravel. And sometimes they're stupid and they put it on a gravel road. That, that's not good. But they didn't know the cars were coming. So, or the people or whatever. But um, yeah, they're, they're in it. So most of you probably know the killdeer, but did you know they were related to those little shorebirds that are on the beach? Probably well, some of you know that because that, it's is, not in their name. Another, this is another one that I have my QC name for. Oh yeah, come don't, on, <laughs> he's gonna do this. Don't, don't kill me, dear. I, I bought oh, two don't necklaces. Kill me, dear. <laughs> Well, if, if, if you're as careless as these guys where they put their nests, yeah, they need to be shouting that really loudly because, um, you know, I've seen more little dead killed her chicks than I care to remember. All right. So this is a medium sized sandpiper. Remember, we were looking at those little tiny sandpipers before. We're kind of coming up in size. This is a long billed dowager and it has um, it has another species. Uh, you know, right next to it um, in its genus that uh, is called a, a short-billed dowager. It's not that easy to tell them apart unless you hear them say something because they do sound different, but um, I'm not going to get into that. But I will tell you, you just know that that's dowager species just by that black line by its eye. And then here's another uh, sandpiper that's just a little bit bigger. And in in the breeding season, if you want to go up to the Arctic, it would be speckly like the other sandpipers. But in the winter, it goes as drab as you can go. It goes completely gray. The only thing it keeps is some black tail feathers. And if you look very carefully, you'll see a few little black feathers, you know, sticking out where the, that very, uh, it, it looks like it's molted. It's got a super short tail. And they just, they're all over the place. They're not as big as the biggest sandpipers, they're, but they are bigger than the, um, than the dowagers. But you can have a mixed flock of all these. Now, here's my favorite slide, the long-billed curlew and the marble godwit. Now, they look a lot alike, don't they? 
And what is the difference whether the bill is recurved or decurved and how long it is? So in the name, you've got the long billed curlew curling down. And, um, the, and the other one is the Marlowe Godwit. But the long billed curlew, it isn't an optical uh, illusion. They're close enough together. It's bigger. It's bigger than the than the, the marble godwit. But look at those two tone bills with the pink base and the black tips. They're pretty cool looking, aren't they? So those are an idea of field marks. All right. So let's okay. let's go on. The okay. I I, I did, did want to interrupt a little bit here. We're running long. The so I we might we might skip. We're going to just announce the birds now. Okay, and I put my I put my email address in there. I will uh, for anybody uh, requesting it. We'll send out the uh, recording uh, link, and also if you request, we'll send out any of the uh, appropriate slides uh, that have uh, informational uh, right, right. data. And moving along here, so okay. so very important. To, to do this. This is a, a sparrow. We only have it in the winter, but it stays a really long time. It comes back kind of like September and it leaves the first week of May. I know that because there's people that watch their yards to figure out when it leaves. And this is a bird that will be in your yard. And it's easy to tell who it is because it has, you know, the yellow bill. And then how about a bird that is, the next one is going to be a bird that stays here all year long. This is your California telly. He's so plain looking, but both of these birds, look at that bill. Don't you feel like they could crack a seed? So they're the birds you see scratching around underneath bushes, picking up seeds. Now, the next one is that bird that we had in the Merlin. This is a fascinating bird to put between seed eaters and insect eaters because he eats both. A lot of birds are specialists. They only eat like one kind of food, but a red-winged blackbird with both eats both seeds, and um, he said it has an ambidextrous eating behavior. So now the real seed eaters, the real seed eater, the real insect eaters, have tweezer-looking bills because they catch the insects in the air. The red-winged blackbird doesn't do that so much. He does it a little bit, not much. And this is the black Phoebe. This one's in your yard. You see him kind of sally out and catch an insect and go back to a little pole. Mm -hmm. And the one that is also here all year long in Orange County is that, well, maybe a says Phoebe might, maybe, oh, they, they do go inland a bit to nest. But the black Phoebe's nest here. I've seen lots of black Phoebe nests. So keep an eye out for them. They're, this one is more like you're going to have to go to a park, you know, that is kind of a little wild to see a says BB. But I love its feeding behavior. It catches these big insects, things like dragonflies and uh, butterflies, all these things with the wings that don't have any nutritional value for this bird. So he's got a way, usually he has a good perch like this. And I guarantee you, if this is his main perch, underneath it is a pile of insect wings because he's just whops them off somehow. I don't know how he, he, you know, he must have, the must, bird must have a way to do it. And then he can swallow it whole because the body of a dragonfly is small and that's where the nutrition is. So the Says BB is pretty cool. I Also in the insect eater are all the warblers. I'm gonna show you three pictures of warblers. This one is a year round warbler, but most of us, we don't have a lot of them. This one is only here in the winter. And he is also interesting because he eats insects, but he also eats little berries. And so he does what the red-winged blackbird does. But this is, the red-winged blackbird stays here all year. The uh, uh, yellow red warbler uh, migrates away to, to nest. And the common yellow throat gets its name probably because he's got the yellowest throat and he's, He's everywhere. Any place there's a body of water, you may well have common yellow throats kind of skulking around eating insects and underneath the, the, um, the bushes. Corvids. Corvids are, of course, come in two varieties for us, ravens and crows. You tell these two guys apart, 
by their tails. A crow has a pretty flat tail, you know, and not a particularly, it's, it, it looks like it's missing the diamond that's on the, the, the end of, you know, that diamond shape that's on the end of the raven's tail. But the raven wears leggings. His feathers come down almost, you know, almost like it's got little, little shorts on. And he has, his head looks huge because his bill is, his beak or bill is huge. And so the way to tell raven, raven from crow in flight is the shape of the tail. Because at that distance, you can't see the size different. But if a raven is down closer to you, it's huge compared to a crow. I mean, and the wing flap. If one ever goes over you, you'll hear it. It just, it'll sound like whoop, whoop, whoop. It's serious business. So really stiff feathers. Okay, so let's take a look at the gulls. I made that crack about uh, that uh, Western gulls have pink legs. Well, ring-billed gulls have yellow legs and a ring around their bill. So this is, this is sometimes the name of the bird pops up if you fully describe the, and uh, somebody commented on eye color. Look at the color of a ringbill's eyes. He's got the yellow legs. He's got the yellow. Oh my goodness! He's got the yellow eye. All right. Let's see another. And that uh, the ringbill is only here in the winter. Same thing with the California gull. It has yellow legs and a yellow bill, but it has a red spot on its um, the uh, the end of its beak, and it has a dark eye. Now. The California gull has kind of um, a light gray back and that ring bill kind of had a medium gray. And so now let's compare these two guys to the Western gull. Here he comes. Ah. Man, that's his dark slaty gray as you go. And it looks almost black. So this is your Western gull, pink legs, uh, still a yellow bill, but just kind of a, a very small eye on a fa fairly big head. But the big thing is, it's a really big red spot on the bill in breeding season. And that's the only one that stays here and nests off the coast here. All right, geese. We've got geese. We've got geese. We've got too many Canada, Canada geese. Um, and, but we also have, just in the winter, a lot of brant. And we have we have brant geese in Huntington Beach because of the restoration at the Bolsa Chica. They only come in winter. They, they, they nest in the Arctic. They come here to winter because it gets too cold there. They come here because for their food for the winter. They eat eelgrass and all the little things that are the eggs and everything that the fish, the ocean going fish are laying in the tidal basin in the eelgrass. And, you know, We've got, they're, they're a wintering bird. We do have another wild looking goose. And this one, if you love field marks, what's not to love? A brown eye ring. I mean, this guy looks like he's got theater makeup on, the Egyptian goose. But these are really uh, escapees that have basically, um, you, know, uh, you know, adjusted to, they have become endemic, uh, you know. Okay, other. Other is just other interesting birds. Remember I said that a peregrine falcon could knock an elegant turn out. Well, an elegant turn is pretty big, 16 to 17 inches. But the endangered species, and the reason the Bolsa Chica uh, restoration wound up happening is because the least turn is an endangered species. And the field marks here, you gotta love it. It's a yellow bill versus an orange bill, a white forward versus a black forehead. Um, a size difference, but the least turns are the reason that that the money became available and we could actually really preserve our open space out there uh, because they need they need a safe nesting area. There's another one on the mouth of the Santa Ana River, but uh, they're not doing well. Okay, here's a bird. We're going to compare something that it looks a little like, and they're not any way related. This is the belted kingfisher. He is definitely a kingfisher. I have seen this bird sit up on a dead tree, fly down and scoop a fish out and it's flopping around and 
he's you think man he doesn't have big talons or anything he's gonna lose this fish he's not like an osprey he gets up in the tree and he's got it in his bill and he perches himself and he takes that fish and he whacks it against the branch well pretty soon it's dead then he doesn't have any problem he can just at his leisure eat the fish <laughs> i mean he is the king of the fishermen now think about his profile compared to the woodpeckers this is all three woodpeckers we have in huntington central park so you see how they hold their heads and stuff but these guys they're not going to eat a fish they're going to eat insects and they're going to they're going to make cavities in the trees and that's going to be useful to all the cavity nesters but um we have and the way you tell them apart is where the red is on the head you know the downy is the littlest one and then um and it's on the back and then the nuttles has it on the top and the the northern flicker uh he's the I don't know. And when you're in Central Park, if you hear a big call like clear like that, it's it's the northern flicker. They do, they make another sound that sounds like that, but the big one is this ringing. And he's a bigger woodpecker. That's why he can make such big noises. But he's shaped kind of like a kingfisher. I think that there's something about their the way they hold their heads that makes me realize that it's funny. All right, so the last one, oh, hummingbirds. How do you tell the two dominant species of hummingbirds apart? And I think a lot of you probably know that um, the Anna's hummingbird, the whole head can be magenta red in the right light of the male. And that's not true of the Allen's hummingbird. Uh, the top of his head will be green. Um, the, um, his gorget is actually an orange red. This is this is insufficient sunlight to really show that but he has he has brown uh, mixed in with his back uh, where the anis hummingbird is only green these are these are both hummingbirds that could be in our yards here so look out for them and um usually the 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 allens chases the annas away even though he's little pelicans come in two colors and we've seen these in the park this is just a fun slide you know the western gulls and the, the white pelicans but white pelicans in flight with the black tick wings that's a cool field mark no matter what and they've got yellow bills and then the brown pelicans just their ability to plunge dive is amazing but um you know the white pelicans are much bigger they have a huge wingspan egrets egrets something cool all right so first we're going to look well the egret we identified so we know that's a great egret and we know the other one they showed us the snowy egret in that other slide but it's always fun to and i love that other slide because it had every field mark the yellow feet and on the uh, the snowy and the uh black leg, full black legs on the great egret um but show us the uh, the next egret this is one that's at the Bolsa Chica. This is the reddish egret. And um, the thing about egrets, they're white, right? Except this one has a reddish head and a gray body, just like a great blue heron. A lot of the egrets and herons are all really in the same, you know, grouping. They're all they're all heron based. Okay, so there's your great blue heron. So go back to the the. Um, reddish eager for just a sec so yeah he's the reddish eager because he had a reddish head unless you're on the gulf coast and he is the white moor then he is a white egret that is called a in the red he's his genus is or his species is reddish egret but white moor and he has a two-tone bill so he wasn't either of those white egrets he's just a so that's something to know when you're birding that there are some crazy morphs on some of these birds. All right. And so now we're going to look our great blue hair and we know this bird well. He's he's really uh, but here's the fun bird. The last one. This is the last uh, slide that Ron put in. This is the last slide and this is Ron found this and um, double crested cormorant. Remember I said where are the legs on the fastest swimmers underwater? I can tell you, double crested cormorants definitely swim deeper to chase a fish and faster. I have seen them when I've been scuba diving go by my mask at 35 feet down 
and they are fast. Now, there is another cormorant here along the coast, but you're only going to see them if you're looking out at the rocky outcroppings out in the water. And both of these birds would be out there. But if you notice, if you look at the bills on the double crested, and the double that one on the left is starting to get its little white feathers coming in and making the double crest during breeding season. But they swim fast under the water. So the way a double crested cormorant deals with that is it has less oil. It, it doesn't have as active of an oil gland and it can go dive deeper as a result. So consequently to really dry their feathers, they hang themselves on a, their own you know, uh, clothesline. Um, Brant's cormorants do nest along the coast in La Jolla, like that walkway that's in front of the condos. If you look over the edge in the spring, I think it's like April maybe, there could actually be Brant cormorants nests down over the edge because they nest on rocky outcropping. So they, they figure, I mean, they nest right in front of some pretty, pretty um, expensive uh, waterfront property. <laughs> um, anyway, so birding trips that are free, birding, well, you know, just uh, tours, birding tours at local places. The Bolsa Chica Land Trust runs a table the second and third Sundays. And this is one of the slides that Ron can send you if you want for this information. And you just meet, um, you just meet on that lot that's across from the state beach. Um, oh yeah. All right. So he would see those corners. So see, that's cool. The, you guys are, are, are have already been seeing this. I love the kayaking too. Okay. The amigos de Bolsa Chica also run a a a, 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 a walk but they, um, they also meet there on the first Saturday at 9 a.m. And I know that they run both the table and then they have a spotting scope out on um, next to uh, the nesting area for the least turns. And sometimes the Balsa Chica Land Trust will have a spotting scope either on the bridge or uh, up there. Uh, it's, it's easier to see shore, you know, the shorebirds with, uh, with a scope. The Bolsa Chica Conservancy runs a tour out of the North Lot. That's the one that's at Pacific Coast Highway and PCH on the second Saturday. And c and Sage Audubon runs uh, a couple of uh, nature walks and you really should check their website. The nature walk is the first Saturday and the nature walk takes, well, not right now they're having you, um, you know, say you're coming so they don't get too many people at one time but a lot of families come because it's it's suitable for children to learn about nature and then they have birding field trips on the second saturday of the month and uh the 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 uh naturalists that lead those they actually carry scopes and i don't know if you've been to the sam uh joaquin wildlife sanctuary but it is a really birdy place and it's not that far from huntington beach uh, so we put it in there just because you can look at the websites. So that's it. And man, you guys hung in there. <laughs> Thank so you it, all. It, it ran uh, quite a bit uh, longer. But we're not going anywhere. Then, uh, we questions. This is the time that um, we should take. We should take of any questions they might have. Yeah. So you'll have okay. to, and they can. Uh, have you made it so they can unmute themselves? Yeah, let me. Uh, Better do that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's see. I'm looking at the quest uh, at the chat area, and. Uh, oh, what's have, what's one of the questions? Is that uh, they're, yeah, they're let's see. them? Okay. Just one sec. Oh, I hadn't. I hadn't opened my chat, had I? Oh, well, I yeah. could do that. Why don't you open your chat? Because there is. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, okay. I see this question. Okay. So I actually had some back surgery, but uh, there's a rumor that I'm going to be uh, on the tours in March. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to take my scope. I probably won't walk out to the heron nesting area. If you're interested in the, the, the second or third Saturday in March, I'm, I, I always, we always had the third Saturday. I did, I did all of those for years, 
but I, I wound up having to have surgery on my back. So other people, but um, I will probably be out there and I will probably take my scope. I will push, I will push to have my scope out there because I can put it on the bridge and you see so much more if you can look at the shorebirds with the scope. Um, did I take Sylvia's classes? Uh, I took, I have taken so many of Sylvia's classes. What happened was my very close friend of mine here in Huntington Beach, Marinka Horik. She recruited me when I re, you know, retired at, I, well, I have to say I skipped out at about 60. But, and I started, I was gonna do the kids tours and, I, and they said, oh, we want you to do the birds and the animals. And I said, I, I'll, give the, I'll give all the wrong thing, information. I can't do that. She says, oh no, you have to take Sylvia's classes. So I took Sylvia's class. And then I took the sounds and then I took more Sylvia's class. I took the sparrows. I took the short, there's a shorebirds class coming up now. I took that. I've taken all these, the mountain birds, the mountain bird sounds on and on. And then at some point she said to me, um, she can't really walk well and do the tours. So have any of you taken Sylvia's classes? The introduction to Southern California birds because I recommend it, I really do, because it will give you not just a taste of the birds here, but in each of those categories, the reason I can do this is because I understand the categories. So a bunch of us, when she couldn't walk the field trips for her class, and she could teach the classes, but she couldn't really walk the field, the field trips, we have started walking the field trips for her class. So last year before my surgery went off in November, I did the first two field trips, dragging my right leg. <laughs> it was like, my, even my surgeon said, that's insanity. But I said, oh no, I have to do it. I, and I know I won't be able to, but I think at about four months, I'm probably ready to go back out there and and be uh, uh, in the uh, fall, Babs, watch the Babs, website, and you can take the class. Yeah, Babs, I've also taken several right. classes. Ron with, has uh, also Sylvia. taken the class. And uh, it, Syl it's Sylvia Gallagher, and she's uh, known throughout the, the county and the world, the country, really, as uh, uh, premier yeah. uh, teacher of birding. And it's uh, through C and Sage Audubon. And if you uh, want to take a class from her, which uh, is they'll super start. Uh, the registration will be September. You you'll want to download the um, the application for the class off of the website. If you want to, if you want, I mean, this was this was like a taste of birding in Huntington Beach. That is. Knowing the birds of, of Orange County, uh, basically Southern California, that's what that introduction to Southern California birding class is. And that just started it and it made such a difference for this. Then I, then I, once I took that after a while, I, I thought, oh, I wanted, I, I'd love to work with kids that are maybe a little older and microscopes and water studies and pond studies. So. I actually signed up to do the naturalist training through C and Sage, and it was invaluable to have taken Sylvia's classes. I have uh, unmuted everybody or the ability to unmute yourself. They can if, unmute themselves if they yeah, have. If, if there's a question, if not, uh, this has been we'll a wonderful, run away way, wonderful session. Babs is. Uh, is just a wealth of knowledge and her enthusiasm oh, is that. overwhelming. <laughs> you know, you can't you can't listen to Babs and not want to go out tomorrow and start burning. Oh, it's funny they 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 uh, at CSH they call me the big recruiter. You can't imagine how many naturalists they got after I started doing this, <laughs> where I would walk the tours for Sylvia. Uh, so, uh, and I look at these gals and they're doing such wonderful work now, volunteer work for Sea and Sage, but I bet they didn't know that was coming. They had taken the birding class. And the next thing I was just like saying, oh man, this is so much fun. And they came out and they've stuck. I, I have, um, have now good friends that I met them just walking the field trips. Okay, we've got run quite a bit longer than we had anticipated. Oh Thank yeah, you I'm sorry about that. Day.
<laughs> Thank you all. I, I did put up my email address on the chat session and this will be recorded and we'll get information out to you. Thank you all for, uh, oh, uh, Claudia, uh, did uh, you wanna say, have something? Oh. You can unmute yourself. Yes. Or just uh, a wave goodbye. <laughs> It was just a thank you. Okay. And applause. Claudia, thank yeah, it's, you. It's, it's always my pleasure. I mean, I, I, it has it 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 like was awful uh, Christmas bird count for the first time in I don't know how many years this year. And it, and, and the day that it went off, I I just I just sat here and went, ah, I have to make my right leg stronger again. <laughs> this is not working. But I've been working really hard on the PT. So. I'm going to get back out there and have fun. Okay. And I recommend it. it do, I don't care where you get your passion from, but you know, you can just go out there and have fun because we have a lot of open space here in Orange County. I mean, the parks, the regional parks are great. Harriet Weeder is a great place to go. Um, you know, somebody always says, well, where, where are we going to see some of these birds? And I said, it's amazing. Some of the small, those small birds, you know, you can just go there and watch them at Harriet Weeder. I like it. I like doing that. Thank you all. We're going to end the session. Uh, appreciate you all spending a lot of time with us. Hope, yeah. hope you enjoyed it. Uh, almost two hours. Yikes. I'm really long. <laughs>